presence is in the in Iowa City the hospitals of the university and the med school and the clinics were all in Iowa City. Here they're separated and they're over at KU. Now that then has an impact in in somewhat a, maybe a, a different way than you might suspect. But when you look at how much they um, those the employees in those positions are paid, that has a serious impact on your per capita income, yes, which okay. extrapolates into right. you know the resources, quite frankly, that are available mm -hmm. to the community. It's a huge difference. And I think the other thing that it does is you know there, there's a lot of research associated with um, the university and the med school, and so you know you have that benefit being located in Iowa City. The other thing that's kind of interesting is we have a veterans hospital. We had a veterans hospital. I'm still in that seven month transition between there and here. Um, we had the veterans hospital located there and like we do here with Lawrence uh, Hospital, we, we had a uh, Mercy Hospital. So we were second only to Rochester, Minnesota in oh docs my. per capita. Wow. We had a lot of docs. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing that I think is kind of a you know, a land issue difference was that our downtown was probably surrounded by at least two and a half sides of the university. And so our downtown literally, you know, and one of the similarities, you have the whistle that blows. Okay, <laughs> yeah. the we yeah. had I, it's, it, to me, it's a bit of nostalgia, I think, going back to another time. But the students would all be marching back and forth between our downtown constantly. I mean, they just, we have a pet mall, you have open streets. I actually like your downtown better than the Iowa City downtown. Why'd you leave? Why'd I leave? Um, <laughs> I told them when I went there, I'd be there five years. And quite frankly, I was there five years. Um, in five years, you'd be surprised what you could accomplish. And sometimes that sits well, and sometimes that doesn't sit as well. But the group that hired me, um, some of them decided that the run was over. Uh, we had bonded pretty strongly, and I enjoyed working with them. Uh, when I looked at the recruitment notice for Lawrence, it was a little larger community. It probably had some challenges, some more challenges that I hadn't dealt with. Um, I saw myself being able to help the community. But one of the things I made very clear to Lawrence, and Stuart can verify this, is that I wasn't going to be a long-term manager here in Lawrence. <laughs> I viewed myself as somewhat of a transition manager. So I'm not a 20-year, I'm not a 15, I'm not even a 10-year city manager here in Lawrence. Um, I think to this city commission's credit, they were looking for a manager to come in with maybe a different perspective, a little lot more outside perspective. Mm -hmm. So they decided, I think, fairly vocally that they were going to look at somebody that would kind of come from the outside and give their perspective on what they saw. So I thought the matchup was pretty good in terms of this new commission. I thought I accomplished what I told the folks in Iowa City I was going to accomplish. It's a larger community here. I think it has some more challenges. Um, so, you know, you get to a point in your life where it isn't so much always about um, you know, just sticking around and collecting a paycheck. It's about, you know, challenging yourself. And, and I, I think I still have the ability to grow personally. I don't think I know it all yet. So that was part of it. Burroughs Trail? I don't know anything about Burroughs Trail, to be completely yeah. blunt and frank. Do you, Stuart? It stops right at Lennon Street. It just stops at Lennon Street. It needs to be continued to finish the Lawrence Loop. I'll go back to staff and talk to him about it. Right, it's on the rail right Go ahead. Right. Um, before I ask your advice, I just want to uh, concur with your emphasis on the importance of face-to-face -face human communication in this day and age, and that more and more I feel like we need more of that, not less of that. I agree. A city commission meeting is good for acting on policy, but in order to figure out who knows what and right. what we need to do and who has the resources intellectually to do it, we need to get together, maybe in smaller, more uh, you know, yeah. divided groups. So maybe a plug for a neighborhood commission or something like that. Um, in terms of advice, if there were a group in in Lawrence 
they wanted to move towards maybe uh, innovative uh, approaches to very core matter energy information infrastructure such as information something like Chattanooga Tennessee that is, has a municipally entrepreneurial approach to information technology mm -hmm. that supplies everybody you know high speed bandwidth that becomes more and more important we just saw that AT&T has been exposed for keeping tons of data and selling it off to all kinds of people um, so maybe we need to have our own data infrastructure so that, that we take care of um, energy to, to be able to have that know that we can uh, respond to an emergency with a with enough uh, backup power that's not dependent on an out-of-state corporate entity um, matter something like water you know innovative uh, effective ecological approaches to capturing rainwater uh, processing wastewater that type of thing where what in this kind of system in this manager city commission type of system would the approach be to go through the city commission through the city manager uh, or sort of both at the same time? Well, I, I think that what you're talking to is clearly an issue that, that kind of fits best into strategic planning. And so there's this program out called Star Cities, and, and basically what it does is it evaluates every city on a number of issues, social justice, sustainability, environmental issues, fiscal issues, um, a whole gamut, there's probably eight. And uh, one of the things that I've tried to do is, is talk to our staff about using that in the strategic planning process. So you come up with goals, right? So you have these lofty goals. Well, how are you going to achieve those goals? Well, um, for example, if we had a goal of a more sustainable um, Lawrence, um, well, how would you achieve those? So you start to list out projects, objectives that you work on, and you start to infuse those. And it's, you know, it's not a one and done. It's not, you know, it's not a five-year program and you're done with it. It's an ongoing process, which is why strategic planning, in my opinion, is so important to a community that you start to infuse those things into that process. Then they start to inform how you spend <laughs> your money. So I would say to you, pay attention to this whole strategic planning process that we're going forward with and the Star City program. And I think that there's opportunities for you there. There's, there's probably specific categories in that Star City program that talk about those very issues that you're talking about. Now, tangentially, there's another issue there, and that's the whole issue of big data. And I read a quote here recently that privacy is somewhat of a recent invention. And, uh, and, I, and I had to think about that. Right? I mean, I had, yeah, I guess it kind of is, isn't it? And, and I think we're losing our privacy every day. And I think with big data, I mean, you've read all the stories about how you're profiled, right? And then all of a sudden you get something in the mail or on the net, and, it, and it's marketing something to you, and it's based on what you've clicked on and what you've looked at, right? So it's, it's really becoming a part of us. Uh, to a large extent, and I'm not sure a lot of people even understand that. I recently got in a conversation with an individual in the community who was very upset about uh, information um, that was being, records attention that were being kept. And I understand that, and yet he's probably the most prolific writer of emails to us all the time, and I kind of went, don't you understand? that every one of these things that you're sending us, you know, is somewhere, somewhere you know, that's right. probably capturable right. at some level, right? right. So I, I think this stuff is moving so quickly that it, it kind of moves beyond, what well, you know, a deep thought about, well, how is this stuff going to be used? Where is it going to be housed? And all of that. So mm -hmm. that to me is all part of the change that we're involved in. Go ahead. How do you envision a an affordable housing program being funded on a on a continuing basis? Yeah, um, I think it, 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 managers at their core are persons that match resources to demands for service and other things that, that their jurisdictions want. So that was that. That whole discussion occurred during our whole interview process, and one of the things that we did, um, there's 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 two kind of 
issues here that seem to be almost like bookends with maybe different faces on the bookends. You've got affordable housing and you've got economic development, right? And so when I was in Iowa City, one of the things that we tried to do is fuse the two together. And so what we, you know, when you give an incentive for economic development, one of the purposes, um, one of the reasons has to be that there is a public purpose for doing that, right? It has to be, it could be uh, additional good employment, it could be additional tax base, it could be affordable housing, it could be, you know, street improvements or infrastructure improvements, it could be contributions for park, it could be all of those things. So we started to infuse the requirement into our um, incentive, and so we've started that here. In fact, Stuart listened to me during the interview process and, and used some of the, the ideas and, and commentary to extract some funds during a, a, a development proposal that somebody was making in town and got a contribution to our housing trust fund. So I'm a big believer that, that affordable housing needs to be dispersed, okay? It needs to be everywhere. It can't just be concentrated by geographic location, and it can't just be focused entirely in one facility. I spent 11 years in Cook County. I'm completely familiar with Cabrini Green and Robert Taylor Homes. Uh, my son was a police officer for the city of Chicago for nine years. Um, so I have a lot of kind of family, you know, involvement in some of these issues. And while I'm sure there were societies that were built, very good societies that were built in those facilities. I think there's a stigma associated with, with facilities when they're really concentrated. And, they, and, and that's not healthy for, um, especially not healthy for the people that, that live there. Um, I think the other thing is we all know that when you have an over-concentration and you have um, elementary schools and middle schools, where there isn't a balance, whether it's all affluent or all non-affluent, it's probably not the best learning environment. I think the studies suggest and show that sort of thing. So I believe in getting it scattered site, okay? And I think, quite frankly, you know, there's a reluctance probably to move into the west end of the community, you know, where you have all the new development going on. So I think incentives, I think, you know, other requirements, one of the things that we talked about was inclusionary zoning during the interview. And before I even got here, the state legislature dealt with it, and I'm told that the legislature was paying attention to what was going on in Lawrence conversations. Do you think that's right? Yeah, I think it's right. Yeah. So there, there, there's lots of ways to go about it. We have to look at everything. We have to look at best practices around the country. You know, we're making some general fund contributions. I think it amounts to about a, you know, a million... 350 or something over a five-year period. Um, I think that's a start, but it, 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 it you know, I, I have to tell you, I, I don't know that any of this stuff is all that sustainable. I think it has to spread across numerous approaches. It can't just be dump the money at it, okay? And I think there's a number of federal programs that, quite frankly, have not been taken advantage of here in Lawrence, and so one of the things that this person I'm bringing in, this consultant, National Development Corporation, which is a nonprofit that does affordable housing and um, incentive evaluations around the country, one of the things I'm having him do is come in and start to educate our city commission, our affordable housing task force, our public incentives. I think that those things get knit together. We have to we have to get our developers. Uh, to understand that there's other opportunities for those things, um, so we have to look at all approaches. I don't think there's a, I don't think there is one answer to any of this stuff. Okay. Go ahead. I have an observation. I'm a careful reader and observer, and you have brought great hope to our uh, city because of all these challenges that have been submerged climbing to the surface and demanding attention. So I think you have plenty of challenges now. <laughs> what I'm worried about yeah, is we're going to wear you out. Yeah. Well, you might only last uh, 
18 months at this rate. <laughs> actually, actually I, I, I tell you that that could happen, especially at this age. Um, but, but I have some techniques that I use, okay? Um, sometimes it's just driving away. Um, you, you, no, just, you know, you need at times, you need, you need at times to decompress, right? So you need to get away from the day-to-day -day grind because you can let that eat yourself. The other thing is, believe it or not, I'm actually pretty handy. And so I work on projects around the house to get my mind off this stuff. Because I know it'll eat you up if you let it. And so we have a lot of things, and I have a conscience, okay? And, that, you know, I'm, I'm plagued with a conscience that I think about this stuff way too much. Mm -hmm. um, my wife is, um, she's the best in the world that puts up with me and has followed me all over the Midwest at these different jobs I've worked at. So I don't have that kind of conflict to worry about, and she's just been greatly supportive. Actually, Debbie and I met in an urban finance class 40-some <laughs> years ago, and she was in, I was in a graduate class, and somehow she managed to work her way through the system and get stuck in this graduate class, and she was an undergraduate. So, being the generous person I am, I helped get her through that class. <laughs> yeah. and, and it bloomed into a relationship that's going strong ever since. So, you know, so I, yeah, it can burn you out, but I'm not there. Um, and, and quite frankly, I don't read all the comments, okay? Because, because people that can write those kinds of comments, um, I'd rather they confront me face to face and have a conversation. I just don't read the stuff. I, you know, my wife reads it, and she tries to keep it away from me. So, um, you know, it's, it's part of the game. Go ahead, back there. I, I moved to Lawrence in uh, 71, and um, I think there were 40 or 50,000 people living here then. And we're around 100,000 now. Yeah, approaching 100. Are we going to go on forever like that, expanding? And I don't understand that philosophy. Well, some things are out of our, necessarily out of our control. Um, but what I would say to you, I think one of the concerns I have um, is this east-west divide in our community. Oh, right. mm -hmm. And um, it seems like we have, and, and by the way, you asked about similarities. Yeah. That's the same dynamic that existed in Iowa City. Mm -hmm. And I think we have a little bit more involvement in Iowa City than we do here in Lawrence from our west sides. Um, and I think what you have are a lot of folks that are commuters. And so unfortunately they're consumed. I mean, if you're commuting to Topeka, yeah. you know, a, an hour out of your day is on the road, right? And you're probably raising a family and so you're dealing with kids in school and you're dealing with all those issues. You don't really have the time to be engaged necessarily community. Um, and I think when you look at our east side, our east side tends to have uh, more the characteristics of the time that it was developed. So maybe a little smaller lots, uh, maybe more, you know, community engagement within their neighborhoods, um, that sort of thing. And I think those things make differences. Um, oh, yeah. I'm concerned about suburbia in general mm -hmm. and how survivable it really mm -hmm. is. And so I think that those are things that are challenges to all of us um, as we go forward. And, I, you know, one of the things, I grew up in Minnesota. Minnesota has what's called the Metropolitan Council. And the Minneapolis-St. Paul area and the, and the Collar counties are all in this Metro Council. Well, the region owns the sewer system, okay? And you don't extend the sewers the interceptor sewers until like 70% of the capacity is used in the sewer. And so what you're doing is you're really getting a return on your public investment for that sewer before you just start pushing things out everywhere. And so we have some infill redevelopment opportunities that I think we have to keep looking at in our community and making sure that we are maximizing the return on the public infrastructure investments that we've made. So, for example, 
if you had um, an opportunity to move out, you know, and annex an area, and you added 1,000 more people, okay, to your community, but that 1,000 more people required you to build a whole new fire station and man that fire station, okay? Do you realize the cost impact that's then spread across the rest of the community? It's huge. So, to me, I think it's about sustainability, right? You know, sustainability has a financial equation to most of it. And so if you're going to make those public investments in infrastructure, make sure you maximize your return on them. And I think, you know, quite frankly, the, the, the day of really large lots and, and uh, what do they used to call them, McMansions and things like that, I think you're always going to have, you know, a certain population that will like that and maybe build some of them. But I think sustainable um, development is, is something that we have to really have a conversation about. Go ahead. I think it's related to what you said that I was curious. I had a chance to um, help out from 2001 to 2005 with the task force on Please. homeless concerns. And what I noted, and I think you were referring to that, you know, the city did not put money into hiring a grant writer. You know, so I'm curious, you know, I, you know, do you, because you're talking about best practices around affordable housing and stuff like that, would that be inclusive of the city having a grant writer to make sure some, all of the grants are get it, get gotten, do you know what I'm talking about? An actual hired grant writer. Yeah, I know what you're talking about. And, and what I would say to you is I have an expectation of our staff that they have that capacity right. and they have that capability. I do too. And quite frankly, um, should have that. Um, just like I, my expectation is, and you'll notice maybe at some of these meetings that I'm not the biggest talker at all these meetings, okay, at City Commission. <laughs> yeah. And one of the reasons is um, I'm here for a short time. I'm trying to develop the staff. And so I, my expectation is that they, they carry the recommendation from origin all the way through um, the commission to, to, to success. And so like that, I think that's a skill set that we have to evolve and develop inside our staff. I don't think that resounds to just one person writing grants. Right. And we have quite a few people on staff. I didn't even mean that, but usually there's someone that knows better how to organize it. And I did see... And we do have those people. I'll tell you right now, I sat in some of the block grant writing where huge sums were not gotten in. It was just enormous. And what I noticed, and then I'll end it, in the newspaper they mentioned that the Chamber of Commerce is giving some money to that Heasley Center, you know, for economic development that will influence you. But the first thing they mentioned that money was going to go to was getting a grant writer. You know, because they, so I just wanted to point that out, that there could be a weakness in not having someone better coordinating that. Yeah, and, and what I would say to you too about the Heasley Center, that's one of your big pluses.